<laughs> the following interview was conducted with Sally Watling, Captain U.S. Navy, retired, Purdue class of 1960 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October 8, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon and good morning to you, Sally Watling. Good afternoon okay. and good morning to you. <laughs> Let's start. Tell us about where and when you were born and <laughs> parents and early in years. 6th of May, 1938, Denver, Colorado. Col and uh, my parents, William Thomas and Margaret Stewart Watling, both deceased. Okay, do you have any siblings? I have no siblings, I'm an only brat. All right. And tell us a little about uh, school and then high school. So what's All right. School. Grew up to about age eight in Denver, Colorado, and then moved to Rockford, Illinois where my father became the personnel management manager for Barber Coleman Company, which meant he hired a lot of engineers and uh, made many trips to Purdue University. And when it came time for me to select a school to go to, he said, take a look at Purdue, which I did. But got through high school in... Uh, uh, in the Chicago area? No, no, Rockford, oh. Illinois, okay. which is north and west of Chicago, about 100 miles. Okay. And, uh, what was high school? Were there any student clubs or what was... Any teachers that uh, you recalled? Oh yes, okay. a lot of them. Too many to mention. Okay. All very nice. And uh, was I it made a large, large class. I graduated in a class of 432. And uh, but I had uh, fine teachers, particularly English and history. And uh, I also served, worked on the student newspaper for uh, three years and played in the orchestra for three years. And what instrument did you play? I was a bassoonist. Well, how about that? Did you pursue, continue that or? Absolutely not. The Purdue band could have used <laughs> you. Well, if, if you know woodwind instruments, they're double, this one is double reeded, and it is a, not, while not terribly heavy, it's not the kind of instrument you just kind of put in your pocket by any means, but uh, we couldn't afford to buy me a bassoon, so. I didn't okay. carry on the bassoon past high school, okay. but I served on newspaper in junior high school and in high school for six years. Okay. And uh, when I got ready to look for a university, of course, came, went to Illinois University, went over to Iowa, went up to Wisconsin, went to Northwestern, went to Indiana University, Purdue University, and I got home and Daddy said, well, and I said, I want to go to Purdue. Thank you very much. And, and all four years that I was at uh, P Purdue, I could see my dad at least three or four times a year because he'd come down here to hire engineers. For the company? For the company, right. yes. Okay. I, said, I wasn't stupid, I'd get to see my dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, uh, then ROTC, tell us about campus life and professors and your program, course of studies. I was, uh, I started out in pre-med, which was, of course, heavily loaded with, with science and, and the, the German language that I knew I was going to have to take two years' worth. And then got through freshman year and I decided, no, I really don't want to do that. And uh, mother suggested that I try for <laughs> a degree that would give me a job afterwards. So that was teaching, social studies major, biology minor, to teach school. And uh, when it got around to uh, student teaching, I went to West Lafayette High School to do my student teaching. When I got done with that, there was no way I was going to be a school teacher. In the meantime, uh, I was a member of Mortar Board, which is now the Barbara I. Cook chapter of Mortar Board, but back then yeah. it was just Purdue Mortar Board. And Helen Schleeman, the Dean of Women at the time, had written an article for the Mortar Board Quarterly uh, talking about all of the opportunities for women in the armed forces. And she tested that article on the Mortar Board chapter, see, see if she'd left things out that should be pertinent or whatever, and we all, you know, read it and made comments on it. Well, that got me interested in looking into the armed forces, and I went around to all the recruiters, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, five, and settled on Navy and pursued that. And when I graduated from Purdue... Oh, you weren't in, in ROTC? In the ROTC, ROTC okay. did not come about until 1972, okay. and we graduated our first class of, of uh, midshipmen here at Purdue, uh -huh. of women, in 1976 when I arrived as XO of the Naval right. ROTC. But you were not in the uh, R uh, Absolutely not. Fleet. Women it. were not allowed to be in ROTC, nor were we allowed to go to uh, the Naval Academy. The only place you could get your commission is through Officer Candidate School, Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. okay. So that summer of graduation in 1960, 
I went off to Newport, Rhode Island. Tell us a little about that. How did that March go? two, three, four. Up oh, two, three, four. <laughs> That's where you. That learned. must have been an awakening. Yeah, that was an awakening. It was kind of fun, because they they weren't really serious about uh, you know marching in large formations. They they had us marching in what we would almost call uh, a show marching. Yeah, I'm just kind of fun, right. just fun stuff. And uh, but uh, they taught us all about ships, aircraft, and weapons. How many yeah. females were there? I was in the class of 34, and there were 34 of us. So it was all women? All women, yeah. Okay. Oh, you did, they didn't train men and women together. Oh, okay. All right. okay. <clears throat> oh, no, because we were all in different, going in different directions and different tracks. And while the men would be going to sea, either submarines, uh, on aircraft, or shipboard, we were all going to go do administrative jobs. Okay. Communications, okay. admin, teaching. Support. Support stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. so that kind of thing. And that brings us to what we were talking about, too. Um, your career path before you came, including your time at Purdue. Mm -hmm. I was, well, they highlight. designated an 1100 officer unrestricted line. And what that meant was a chief cook and bottle washer of the paper factory. So I started off in Washington, D.C. as a baby ensign as a s assistant to the reserve officer promotions folks. Two years later, they asked me if I wanted to go to Yakuska, Japan, or whether I wanted to go to Naples, Italy. And that was a no-brainer. I wanted to go to Naples, Italy. So I spent two years there on the staff of the NATO, for, uh, NATO organization, Allied Forces Southern Europe. Came home and said, they said, well, we've got a little mess going on down in Corpus Christi, Texas. We'd like you to go down there and straighten it out. And mind you, I am not even promoted to lieutenant yet. I'm in lieutenant junior grade. <clears throat> so I thought, this is a real come on. Go down to Corpus Christi and straighten out a mess. I'm not smart enough, nor have I had enough training to straighten out anybody's messes. But I went down there and I was assistant security officer and assistant for women, which meant I was responsible for all of the enlist enlisted women on the base. Uh, they all had to live in barracks, and during the day they went out to their jobs all across the base. Well, that's why I real when I realized that I was down there to take care of something. So after we did that, I was back to Washington, D.C. as the uh, social, and, uh, social and Appointments Secretary to the Chief of Naval Operation. That was the top Navy Admiral. And uh, did that for three years under two admirals. And the second admiral was Admiral Thomas Hinman Moore, who was selected to go down and become the Chief uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he said, Sally, I want you to come down there with me and do down there what you're doing up here. I said, <coughs> Admiral? I can't do that. I cannot spend another three years in that kind of a job or I'll be dead in the water promotionally. I won't be able to go up. That's all I'll be able to do. And I said, are there other things in the Navy I want to do? And he said, okay, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to postgraduate school at Monterey, California, and I want my major to be management personnel option. And needless to say, he made that happen. And so from Washington, get my degree at the postgraduate school, one-year program, and then I was sent back to, made promotion to lieutenant commander by that time, and went to Bainbridge, Maryland as executive officer of recruit training command for women. And we had, we had women all over the place and marching up and down in the drill halls and getting their uniforms and so forth. And about, uh, year and a half into that job, they said, well, we're going to move all of Recruit Training Command for Women down to Orlando, Florida, where the men are located. And the men had been located in Orlando, San Diego, and Great Lakes. So they said, we're going to take the women from Bainbridge, move them all, and the program down to Orlando. So I, I, and that's what we did. And I spent- Disney World was not there at that time. Uh, it was just being built. Okay, okay. It was just being built. and. Um, but we, uh, we joined, went on the same campus with the men, and uh, finally they merged the two, the two uh, recruit training command for men and recruit training command for women were merged together. And if the commanding officer of the recruit training command was a female, then the executive officer would be a male, vice versa. If the commanding officer of the recruit training were a female or male, well, that's how they worked it, and it worked out just fine. And from there, hmm. How did you like living in Washington? Did you live well, I've, been, I've lived sort of, I was, lived, first time was in a little apartment, uh, uh, three, three floor walk up with no air conditioning, overlooking the commissary at Fort Myer. 
And then I lived, uh, oh me, lived up in Bethesda, Maryland when I was on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations. And then I went, came back another time and was on the uh, Bureau of Naval Personnel staff. And that was on Columbia Pike in a two bedroom apartment. And then after that job, and I marched across the captain, the admiral's desk when I told him I wanted to go and be executive officer of the Naval ROTC unit at Purdue University. And he said, women can't be XOs of Naval ROTC units at any university. And I said, why? And he said, cuz. And I said, why? And he said, because you don't know anything about ships and going to sea and aircraft. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, what about all the other things that have to happen? And not the least of which, you've got women in your Naval ROTC program and they need to see other women. Oh, hadn't thought about that. He said, well, Purdue may not want you. I said, look at my record. What university did I get my degree? Oh, Purdue. I said, right. <laughs> you got your ducks all lined up. Straight for me. Since I walked across his desk. So he, uh, he nominated me to Purdue University, and they had uh, re veto rights. They would only send one candidate name at a time, and they either take it or leave it. So in other words, the appointment is approved by the university for the ROTC. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm thinking of researchers might. Oh, what? How is that? Occur? Yeah. No. Uh, the, the the nominee is sent from the from the service in this case the Navy mm -hmm. uh, to the vice president for uh, student affairs it was student services back then, mm -hmm. and it went before what we used to have, and I don't know whether they still do, but they probably do, uh, a military advisory committee. And he took it to the Military Advisory Committee here on campus, and they had to vet my grades both at, while I was at Purdue and at postgraduate school. And uh, so they said, yes, I could come. So I came, 1976, and I bought a house. So I had all that stuff, and then the next time I went back to Washington, which was where my last tour was, uh, I bought a house in Annandale, Virginia. So I finally graduated from apartments. I was really, really tickled to graduate from apartments. I was tired of apartments. Tell us what your responsibilities and duties here in camp, when you were here at, uh, during that time at, on campus. I mean, as yeah, XO of the Naval R2C? Right. Well, it was really an awful lot of paper pushing. And, and was your office in the armory? Yes. Okay. We moved the, they moved the office from Ag Campus to the armory the day I arrived. Oh, you've been on the Ag and they, Campus? Yeah, they've been down at the Ag Campus. And they moved up into the ROTC. Uh, the, in, the Army had b been there. The Air Force and the Navy had not. So they invited the, they fixed up the second floor. Oh, okay. The Army moved over because they didn't have many cadets. And the Navy moved in. We had 350 uh, NROTC folks. And then we also had about 150, 200 uh, NESEPs, Naval Enlisted uh, Program, who came from the fleet to get their degrees to go back to the fleet and be officers. But um, no, had a lot of had a lot of fun on campus. Uh, reacquainted with Helen Schleeman, Bev Stone, Barb Cook, Bet Betty Nelson, and uh, Linda Ewing, who was uh, on the dean of women's staff at that time, dean of dean of students now, of course. And uh, reacquaintance, and, and uh, it was like I'd never left campus. That's interesting. But it had changed a lot since you came. Oh back. yes, it right. it had changed a lot. Because in the meantime, in when you came back in '76, was that the first time you'd been back since you graduated? No, oh no, no, no. I've been back. You've a been back times, in yeah. between. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So we uh, did three years of that and went off to San Diego, California, to my major shore command, and was promoted to captain, and did three years there, and then went to Washington D.C. back to Washington D.C. for what was known as the post major command tour. And I worked for a commandant, or a comm you know, we used to call them commodores. Commodores, and that's a rear admiral lower half. And I was his deputy. After a year in that, I decided I was going to retire and come home. And how many years had that been in? Had you been in that? 23 and a half. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So I came home. Lived in Helen Schleeman's basement for six months while trying to find a house. You decided to come back to, to Lafayette? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. That's okay. I knew I was going to come here to retire. That was never a question. Okay. Just a matter of when. Okay. Mm -hmm. All righty. Now let's talk a little bit about the um, christening of the uh, Dorothy Stratton. The Coast Guard Stratton, ship right. Stratton, which right. is is mm -hmm. officially 
It is known as Stratton WMSL 752. Okay. That whole, that's their hull number. And uh, the Coast Guard had arranged uh, over a year ago for uh, Mrs. Obama, Michelle Obama, to be the sponsor. How did the invitations uh, come to you? How did you get the invitation? Well, first they, they went out to the family, okay. finally. Uh, because they'd never discussed this with the family. First, the family knew that there was going to be a Coast Guard cutter Stratton. That's when I called and told them. And that Mrs. Obama was uh, the sponsor designated. But um, Did you know Dorothy when you were here before? I was her caretaker for the last 10 years of her life. No, I mean, when you were here as on the NROTC, did you know? No, because she didn't live here. She didn't? Oh, okay. All right. Helen Schleeman, that's another story. Helen Schleeman sent me to Connecticut to pick Dorothy up with her car and bag and baggage and drive her to Lafayette. Okay. And she lived with Helen Schleeman. Okay. All right. But the, back to the christening. We all, uh, Coast Guard headquarters, got the family names and addresses and asked them who all else. They also sent a letter to Purdue University and uh, asked them if anyone, you give them a list of names. So they compiled these lists of names. All right. Okay. And uh, the preparation is good. <laughs> Researchers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we, we ultimately, after toing and froing, we ultimately got our invitations and we decided we'd go down. And the we is Betty and Dick Nelson, and I went in one car, Grace Lechtenberg, Linda Sorensen, Mary uh, Sadowski. Mary Sadowski and Mary Reese went in the second car, and then Sandy Monroe, uh, assistant to the vice president, or vice president's assistant, I forgot what it is, over at Student Affairs, and a midshipman, woman midshipman, who had received two of the Dorothy C. Stratton scholarships. Laura, Laura, I've interviewed her. Yep. Laura Pedef, yes, yep. right. Uh -huh. Cute. We had a wonderful time. She's very, very personal. Yeah, we us. had a wonderful time with her. And then Tony Hawkins drove himself. And, and Tony and Joyce went down separately, and they weren't part of this this group. Okay. And, uh, and I made name tags for everyone based on whether they were family members, extended family, or friends of Dorothy from Indiana. Okay. And with red, white, and blue, or red, or white, or blue, depending on what, what they chose. And those name tags got us in through Secret Service, police, and everyone else at the, at this, at the christening site. And uh, but Mrs. Obama, of course, attended as well as the Commandant of the Coast Guard, Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, who happens to be a woman, Vice Admiral Sally Bryce O'Hara, which we were tickled to death, the second Coast Guard Vice Admiral. And uh, we listened to all this, and, and uh, Janet Napolitano, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security, was there, and the wife of the Governor of the State of Mississippi, and of course the President of Grumman, uh, Northrop Grumman Shipyard. They all gave their speeches, and Mrs. Obama was escorted over to the bow of the ship, and they had a plat raised platform, and it's all done in red, white, and blue bunting. And the, the bottle is inside a casing, and the whole thing is a, it's like a knit sock is drawn around the whole bottle, and it was hanging from the bow of the ship. And what she had to do was to take the bottle and crack it across the bow of the ship. Well, she took the bottle and sort of went, poop, it didn't break. And so the, the president of Grumman, Northrop Grumman, said, Mrs. Obama, hit it harder. So she took it in two fists, and she cracked it like swinging on a baseball back, and there was glass everywhere. <laughs> Not on her, though. Uh, no, but it was in the pockets of the president of Northrop Grumman, and this mangled thing was just hanging there by this sick sock. Everybody just had a good laugh over that. I bet, yeah. Because when she finally decided she was going to break that bottle, she broke the bottle. Right. So. Well, tell us about the seating and, and the arrangements in there. You were close up? Yeah, I was in the, about the third row, sort mm -hmm. of in the middle of things. And, uh, were the all the Purdue was, people sort of up front as well? Beg your pardon? The Purdue people from oh, Purdue? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the oh, family? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The family was accorded the privilege of being two rows down from the from the, uh, the stage area, I was sort of over in another section next to it. But I was right in line with the bottle and the, pr and the bow of the ship when they marched Mrs. Obama over there. And uh, so we all sat there in the first two or three rows. This is a covered tent-like affair. Well, it's hotter than Hades. and uh, In July. In July. And so they had fans and coolers going all the time. 
But uh, Mrs. Obama did her thing, and she did a very nice job. Of uh, and her remarks were right on about Dorothy. And um, then afterwards, they all we all trooped over to a reception tent, and the family was taken in the back way of the reception tent so that they could have a photo op with Mrs. Obama. I went in the tent with all of my crew, our crew that had traveled there, and we went over to an area that we knew where the spars were all being collected because they were going to have a photo op with Mrs. Obama. So we went over there to see how they liked everything and so forth, and a Secret Service agent uh, came over and, he, and she said, Captain, come with me. And I said, oh, what's this about? Well, I knew that there might be an opportunity for a photo op or something because they'd asked, uh, they'd asked me for name, rank, and serial number in case of so, so, so the Secret Service could vet me through the system. And so went in there, and sure enough, I had a photo op with Mrs. Obama. Right. And right after that, she had the photo op with the spars. There were 20-some of them. Wonderful. And you've got to know, they were all up in their 80s and 90s. In fact, we celebrated uh, Betty Reed's 97th birthday. She didn't know we were coming, but we did, and brought our champagne with us. She told me about that. Mm -hmm. That was, and she has pictures of the cake. That was a real yeah, big surprise. Cute. Yeah, it was that's cute. really the family member, yeah. right? Who are the extended family? Can you uh, Dick we, Nelson, we, Betty Nelson? No, I mean Sally. Yeah, that's extended, it. the family of Dorothy that were there. All right, her her niece Barbara Stratton Myers. Okay. And her husband Morgan, and Rick Stratton, M.D., is her nephew. Now on, on Barbara's side of the family, there are, those are the only children. She had two daughters, Melinda the eldest, and Megan, second, number two. And each of, they had, Melinda, or Melinda had two daughters, and Megan had, I think, daughter, son, or may have been reasonably first, because they all ran together. But anyway, so we had all 11 of Dorothy Stratton's next of, living next of kin at this ceremony. Wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah, right. It was wonderful. Um, let's talk a little, make some comments about Dorothy because you know her in her own words. And mm -hmm. for the researchers, we have a lot of the materials mm -hmm. and you've given some, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? It will be an enhancement for the collection. <laughs> well, um, Dorothy, when, when I went out to Connecticut to pick her up and bring her home to Indiana, um, that was 1986 and she was 87 years old. And uh, she lived with Helen Schleeman, who had been her number two commander, Helen B. Schleeman, U.S. Coast Guard Reserve, back in World War II, was retired from Purdue as dean of women. And they had been good friends for years, since 1933, when both of them came to campus. And uh, Dorothy lived with Helen until, Linda, until Helen passed away in 1992. And I moved Dorothy from her house, from Helen's house on Western Drive to Westminster Village Independent Living. Moved the furniture that she was going to use, moved her, got her all settled in there, and then I cleared out Helen Schleeman's house and made it ready for, uh, for sale. And uh, <coughs> Dorothy got along really well there in Independent Living. In 92, she was 93 years old. She was quite independent and wanted to let everybody know she was independent. She didn't need anyone nursemaiding her. I said, fine, just call me when you need me. And uh, so she had, went over there periodically to have dinner with her or lunch, and uh, all of our holidays, we had a real regular holiday routine. Barb, I did Thanksgiving. Barb cooked it Christmas Eve. Uh, Christmas Day was Gladys Vale until Gladys passed away, and then I did Christmas Day, and, and, and Dorothy would participate in all of this. Um, and then any other special event we could think of, birthdays, holidays, whatever, we all got together, either my house or Bev Stone's house, Barb Cook's house. But uh, when Dorothy would come to my house just for a, a Could she still drive? Was she still driving? She was driving until, 90, I want to say, 95, and then she voluntarily gave up her, her, her car. She it's knew, easier when you volunteer to do it. Yeah, <laughs> it, well, it sure is. Yeah. And, and she didn't really like to drive all that much, so I did all the driving if she needed to go somewhere. Sure. And, uh, but uh, in the 1995-96 time frame, I'm trying to figure it out too, and I'm gonna have to go back and ask Barbara Myers. She fell and broke her hip, went to the hospital, had the hip repaired, then went back to Westminster Village in assisted living, or Westminster Village in the, in the health center, you know, to, for rehab for the hip. 
And her doctor said, Dorothy, you cannot go back to your apartment. You simply must have more help than you can get living in your part by yourself in your apartment. And of course, Dorothy was furious and didn't want to do this. And I said, Dorothy, the doctor doesn't want to be responsible for your hurting yourself because you are not taking your meds properly or that you're, you know, that's too far for you to walk in any one stretch. Well, grumble, grumble, I'll do it. I said, okay. So I went up to her apartment, took everything out of the apartment, put it on a flatbed dolly, moved it down to assisted living, put it in there, and I only had to bring two pieces of furniture home with me, got everything else in there. And I went down to the health center, got her in her, in her wheelchair, and down the hall, opened the door, pushed her in, and stood in the doorway. And she looked around, and she said, this is all my stuff. I said, did you expect someone else's stuff? She said, oh, it all fits. I said, all but two pieces, and I bet you can't tell me which two pieces I had to take home. And she left me. She said, no. I said, good. You got all your stuff. So she was happy. Right. But when we, I, you know, all the time she was in West Lafayette, whenever I'd have a dinner party, and it'd just be our, our group of Bev and Barb and Helen and da 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 Dorothy would come in with her 3 by 5 postcard, and she'd put it very neatly right by her spoon at her place setting. And then I knew we were in for it. So we'd have dinner, and during dinner, she would refer to this three by five card. She had topics she wanted to discuss. And so when time came, there was Dorothy's turn to initiate the conversation. We were on to topic number one, two, three, four, if we hadn't already discussed it. Because we all knew that when we went to see Dorothy or we're around Dorothy, we better had read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or something because she would be homed in on whatever the news of the day was. So if we'd go through this. Now what she loved to do was throw a question out. How do you feel about X, Y, or Z? And whatever position the person she was speaking to took, she would take the exact opposite of that position. And then we were off to the races. And at that point, Helen Schleeman and I would get up and leave the room because we didn't want to listen to him argue. <laughs> and the best really one to argue with with Dorothy was Barb Cook, because she would just egg her on. Many things, I knew Barb didn't f believe whatever that position she took, but she was playing the same game Dorothy was. Interesting. And they would just fly at it. <laughs> As I said, Helen and I would go to the kitchen, because <laughs> we didn't want to listen to it. But D Dorothy Stratton was probably the most brilliant woman I'd ever met. Yeah and a uh, wry sense of humor, but just very, very bright and quick. And, uh, well, I should say for the research, when we got that Sally Chapman and we had that program, and of course we had done the video that had been done before with Dorothy, and she was not able to come to that back to campus program because she was recovering from the hip thing. Mm -hmm. But we have it as part of the video on that program. Then you can tell me exactly when the hip was broken. It or was what year? It would have been 97. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember what year. That I was kept the year thinking we had the back because that was the 96. anniversary of um, Amelia because she would have been 100 because she was born in 1897. Okay. So that's what it was. And we had okay. that's when we got the Chapman gift, and we had the, the program and things. Oh, yeah. you have. That was going to save me a whole bunch of trouble okay. trying to f remember. Now I can go back in my files. Okay. And find out more about it. 1997. Right. Good. Um, let me ask you this: What are some of the? Can you for the researchers that? Uh, you get some of Dorothy's papers mm -hmm. um, that are in the archives. Can you make a couple? These are things that she had, correct? Well, I tell you, uh, Dorothy did not have many things. Okay. What she had done was to give Helen Schliemann a whole bunch of things. Okay, that were hers. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. Over the years. Okay. Because they were just op polar opposites. Dorothy was not a pack rat. Helen was a pack rat. So if Dorothy would have said to Helen, I think I'm going to pitch this, 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 and this, Helen would have said, no, I'll take it. That's how we got it. Okay. That's how you got it. Okay. That's how we got that, that nice picture of uh, Mildred McAfee of the Navy, Ovita Culp Hobby, Mrs. Roosevelt, Mrs. Streeter, and Dorothy picture that everybody's used all over, the, all over town and nationally. I have the, the original big photo like this, and I had it made smaller and then made it available to people. Mm -hmm. But I still have the big, That's and it's nice. still ear, ear torn and so forth, but it's, it was that big one. 
And then other things, when I was cleaning out Helen's house, I found all this stuff of Dorothy and Helen, all smushed together. Right. Well, That's it nice. all came out, and I saved it. That's wonderful. And when Dorothy passed, I got all that stuff out in my basement, and the family came down, and they took what they wanted. And they left most all of that stuff with me. Oh, that's good. I Things said, that they felt that researchers could, be, could benefit from. They were by. not thinking about researchers at the okay. time. Okay. But they, they just didn't want to have this stuff. And uh, Purdue would have, you know, done right by it and has done right by it with an archive before the archives were ever, sure, right. you know, this, nice new, this new uh, Virginia Kelly Karn right. and uh, Butler's uh, gift to Purdue to have women focal point and women's archives. Uh, but yeah, and of course, I've, we've got lists and lists and lists of all that stuff. Sure, okay. And I. But that's nice, though. You're but doing it's that. and then you know the Helen stuff. Then when when uh, when Betty Nelson and I went through uh, Barb Cook's house, getting ready to sell it, we pulled even more stuff out. Then of Beverly and. Barbara that we thought was it would be interesting to the archives and then found a little bit of Helen and a little bit of Dorothy sure, there too. Oh, sure. right. But I, you know, we trapped as much of that as we could. That's wonderful. It's mm -hmm. great additions because that mm -hmm. was a key thing and, and of course with Bev Stone being the first Dean of Women when they merged the Dean of Men and Dean of Women, it's exactly. just great to have all that, that documentation. Right. And I don't, you probably know this, but Bev Stone was in the Navy in World War II. I think I did recall And she, when she was mustered out, uh, she was a lieutenant and still in the reserves, so during Korea they called her back. This is before she came to Purdue. Mm -hmm. And uh, she retired as a lieutenant commander, United States Naval Reserve. But she did her 20 years of satisfactory federal service, so she got a, a Navy or yeah, a Navy stipend monthly. Okay. But uh, so the only one of the the, <laughs> the Deanie Weenies, you know, starting with Dorothy and Helen and Bev and Barb and Nelson. Nelson and Cook didn't serve in the armed forces, the other three did. Oh, okay. That's and good. I'm sort of the appendage over here because I'm the youngest wicket in this group. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a, I'm in, I, you know, I'm Navy, but I'm not. You're adjunct. I'm, <laughs> I'm adjunct to the Dean of Women, Dean of Students <laughs> office. <laughs> Okay. They all laughed about that. They'd say, they'd say the five deans and Sally. <laughs> I was usually driving the car, picking up the stuff. <laughs> right. You know how that goes. I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some of the awards that you've given or received. One is the, you got two Sagamores. Yes. Um, can you tell me were a little surprised when you got them? I usually ask people what, Astounded. sometimes they're surprised and it's Astounded. wonderful. Astounded. Wonderful. And oh, getting yeah. two. You yeah. know, there's no record on those uh, because each governor can give their own, and so somebody like yourself gets two, but you get them from different governors. Mm -hmm. I've got, got my first one. Uh, uh, from Governor Bai. From 95. Governor Bai, and then got the second one from um, Frank uh, O'Bannon. Uh -huh. And then have a, whatever you call that next one. The Distinguished Hoosier Award. That one Mitch. from Mitch. Dan. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was it. And. Then the other one, which was the first award I'd ever received outside of the Navy, was the the Jefferson Award for Distinguished Public Service, and Evan Bayh, the governor, attended the luncheon and made the presentation. That was quite exciting. Oh, I think so. To meet what the governor. For the uh, researchers, tell them what the, the, that the was name, the, you given me the name, but what does it, the, the award uh, represent? represents public service. Okay. It's, it's an award that is given throughout the country. By state, okay. And each state can give each, each state can give the Jefferson Award, and uh, for that award, that award was for my work with the domestic violence program of the YWCA. Okay. Um, how about the um, couple of others? I'd like to make a comment. The Grand Marquis Lafayette Award. That's okay. Nice. Is there? I have two Marquis Awards. The Grand Marquis de Lafayette Award with statue was presented by the Chamber of Commerce at their annual dinner, and I was the first woman to receive that. Betty Nelson was the second. That's nice. Yeah. That's kind of and special. then the second uh, Marquis de Lafayette Award was pre was presented by Tony Wolsworski. Oh, let me think. I think at the dedication of the flagpole in the Community Health Center's parking lot in 2008. Okay. 
Sounds good. And then you've got the Rotary Club, and you still got involved in that, but Service Above Self, that's an, a very nice. That's a very nice yeah, one. That's very nice. I think the one that... What's your the, outstanding the cute, one? You the, have the received cute, quite a few. Cr- 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 yeah, frankly, busy lady. The, the cutest one, <laughs> the one that I have where I can look at it, is the Boy Scout Award. Okay, tell us because why. Because the, the, it's a bronze Boy Scout, all done up in his Boy Scout uniform. It's just as cute as it can be. It stands about 9 or 10 inches high. Wonderful. And it's, and it's bronze. It's heavy. I can oh. make it a paperweight, but it was the cutest thing yeah, I've ever I'm seen. Carrying in the house, or whatever. <laughs> but that was that was that was cute. Yeah, and you've got the uh, distinguished uh, alumni uh, from the School of Liberal Arts. Mm-hmm. That's right. And you've been pretty active with a. Uh, I was school. active with uh, liberal arts up until a few years ago, and uh, old soldiers never die; they just fade away. You know, new people they needed. They didn't need me sitting around. It's good to give a little oh, fresh things. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Um, any other special special awards that you'd like to comment on? Oh. And you've been really giving back to, to the university and also to the community. Oh, goodness sake. Um, and how about then you got some awards from the Navy as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I was in the Navy, the Navy was not real sure that women should ever have a medal or an award because they don't go to war, they don't fight. They fight paper, but they don't fight. In combat? In combat. Or anywhere close to combat back when I was in, in the service. But uh, when I left the Chief of Naval Operations Office in 1969, I was awarded the Navy Commendation Medal. When I left Recruit Training Command for Women in 1973, I received the Meritorious Service Medal, and when I uh, had my change of command in California, they, I received my uh, Legion of Merit Medal for that, and when I left and retired uh, from the Navy in Washington, D.C. in, oh, let's see, that was 1983, December of 83. Um, that was my second Legion of Merit award. And at that time, I think I was the only one, only woman officer in the Navy to have two. I was also the only woman officer at that time in the Navy who had been early selected to the grades of com- lieutenant commander, commander, and captain. Very nice. Nice So job. I, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've tried to do the best I could. You certainly have. Mm-hmm. Any professional associations you keep involved in? I know you're a trustee with the National Foundation, the Fundraising Award, and Mortar Awards. So you really kept, you still involved that with is, that? That is a, the, the uh, trustee of the Mortar Board Foundation, Inc. Right. is brand new. That's something I said yes to a month ago. Okay. And because the young lady who's the executive director of that, she and I served as advisors to the Barbara I. Cook chapter of Mortar Board from 1984 to 1988. <coughs> Here on campus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good. Now, when I came back, I sure. became advisor to mo- well, the, the community advisor to Mortar Board. Okay. But um, yeah, it uh, all kinds of things. Right. But I have the National Mortar Board uh, Award achievement and the Alpha Chi Omega National Award of achievement. And I think that's about it. That sounds good. How about a uh, Purdue tradition? You have a favorite Purdue tradition? Well, one of the things that we used to do when I was in mortarboard and gold peppers back in the dark ages, every home football game, we'd get to ride on the locomotive into the stadium and around the track. There used to be a track there. I know, I know. You, you remember that track. And we would be deposited where our seats were, and all of the honorary organizations had seats together. I mean, a, a block. Like the block P that they used to have, you know. Yeah, but it was a block of all the honoraries. Right. You know, the Reamer Club, the Tomahawk, all those clubs that probably are gone now. But we Reamer's still here because they run the Boilermaker Special. They run the Boilermaker Special. Right. But uh, so they would run us around the track. And uh, what were the Gold Peppers? Gold Peppers has gone away, but that was an honor society for uh, junior junior women and junior and senior women. Uh huh. And uh, for. Uh, contributions to activities at Purdue. It did not have a grade point average requirement. Okay. 
Just activities that you participate, participate in? Active in participating in activities at, at Purdue University, whether you were on the debris staff, the student union board, the da 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 da, da. So it was, a, and fr usually from that group would be selected the mortar boards. Okay, okay. I mean, you could narrow it down to that number, because we're about 60 or 80, maybe even 100 gold peppers. And we had our little pepper pot hats, little beanies that we wore. And uh, from that group, usually the mortar board, and of course mortar board, when I was a mortar board, were all women. And there were 18 in our mortar board group. Now it's both ma male and female. Well, it's both male and female, right. and they are something like 30 or 35. I thought, I don't know how you can get them in your house. At least when I was on campus and advisor to mortar board 84 to 88, we had 28. I could get 28 kids in my house without standing on one another. But you, that was not... That was not easy. And as, <laughs> as it's gone up, you had to get bigger places to go and meet. Right. I know. It was a little hard to you know, entertain sure. in your home. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. How about an outstanding event? Outstanding you event? You can have more than one in your life. Oh, my goodness. I think one of the, there are a couple. Mm -hmm. um, one, when I was stationed in, in Naples, Italy, John F. Ketty came, and he was about two yards away from me going up the back stairway was past he, my When office, he was president? When he was president. And he stopped to shake hands. Uh, another was uh, when I was in the CNO's office in Washington, 1966-69, met uh, and had a running feud, fun feud, with Re uh, Vice Admiral Hyman Rickover, Admiral Hyman Rickover. He and I had a real thing going. <coughs> he yelled at me, I yelled at him. And we both thought it was fun. And, uh, okay. Uh, I was able to attend the christening, the commissioning, not the christening, commissioning of the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy. And, oh my, meeting and knowing Dorothy Stratton is quite an event being able to meet and have photo taken with Michelle Obama, the first lady of the United States of America, was kind of exciting. Very good. And, uh, oh, I attended the, the coronation of a pope in St. Peter's Square. I'm not Catholic, but I stood there for eight hours waiting for that thing to start with my roommate, who was Catholic. And it went from four o'clock in the afternoon till 8 o'clock at night, and I'd been there since 8 o'clock in the morning, standing in St. Peter's Square. I would never do that again. You do it once in your life, and you've done it. That's one of those once in your life, and boy, once you've done that, you don't volunteer <laughs> to do that again. Uh, on the Dorothy Stratton, let me backtrack a little bit. When uh, it's going to be for the researchers, when will it be launched or commissioned? We, we think uh, early 2012, but that's really... Going to have what to takes place between now and then for the researchers, that, since we've been talking a little bit about the when they When they christened the ship, the insides of it weren't there. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, they put plywood over the outside of the ship so we could have this little ceremony on the bow, but the, all of the equipment and the gear and all the stuff that has to make the ship run... Is yet to be done. Yeah, you have to be done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it it I think in the in the prospective commanding officer believes that it will be uh, February, March, April, two thousand twelve. Now it could get speeded up, and be, but they'd have to do some monumental work to do that. Okay. And they it just will be. In, is it going to be in California? It'll be. My okay. take is they're going to move the ship to Alameda, California. The commanding officer, prospective commanding officer, has been named, and he was he spoke. At the, at the ceremony. At the christening. Uh -huh. And I met he, with him later, and he has three kids, two at the Naval Academy, one at the Coast Guard. I think that's how it went. But he said, you know, I want to get some displays inside the ship explaining Dorothy Stratton to these sailors that will be coming aboard. Can you help me with that? I said, not only can I help you with that, I'll twist the arm of the Purdue University Libraries to help you with that because you're going to need pictures. Mm -hmm. And you're getting stuff, and that's what I want this stuff for. That okay. I've given, I want the, I just want the ribbon and the and the ID bracelet because I think that would be a nice thing. When Dorothy was awarded the Legion of Merit medal, it was by Admiral Weishi, who was the Commandant of the Coast Guard. The second 
Coast Guard cutter of this series was named after Admiral Ray Weishi. The third is named after his good friend and director of the Spars, Dorothy Stratton. And I think that picture with that, that ribbon, because that's all I could, I don't know what she did with the metal part of it, huh. but I have the ribbon. Oh, okay, alrighty. And in closing, is there something that I forgot to ask, but I wanted to ask, you've been really involved with the local community and particularly the Riggs Community Health Center. The Riggs Community, yeah. well, if, if you want, if someone says, well, what, what is your favorite activity? It's usually the one I'm working on now. But I've been well, that's always your favorite book, the one that you're reading Exactly. Now. I've been a volunteer at Riggs Community Health Center. It started out as Tippecanoe Community Health Center mm -hmm. since 1995. And here we are in 2010, and I'm still chairman of the board. Now, I haven't always been chairman of the board. I have. I you went down. The executive officer. I went down there and served interim executive officer while they searched for a new one. Where that happened twice. In too? And I raised $3.4 million to build the clinic. The day the clinic opened, on the 6th of May, 1998, it was bought and paid for lock, stock, and barrel. And I had $350,000 left over. I still have the $350,000 because it cannot be used, in my estimation, until we add on to the building or build another clinic, in which case then we can legally use the money because that was gifted to, the, to, to the, us for construction and equipment, major equipment. For the, for the center. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. And... Uh, but that, that has been uh, an exciting thing and s so needed in this community and serves people in the seven or eight county area around us. We've got people who are really hurting in the field, in, in the area of health care. Right. And we're, in you 2009, we served over 11,000 patients. The building was built to serve no more than 7,500. So we're extending hours. We've got Saturday hours. We, I have the vision that they're going to come to the board and say at some point, Sally, we've got to have hours on Sundays. Yeah. Because this is the worst time in the world to try to hold a capital campaign to either add on, build, you know, get the money to add on to the building right, right. or to build another building right. or even buy another building. So it's open to all the surrounding counties? Is that Oh, sure. Do from we, all cannot, of we cannot deny services to anyone based on their income. Uh, we cannot design, you know, we can't say we won't take people from White County or we won't take people from Montgomery okay. County. We just okay. don't do that. Is it on a sliding scale for it's the payments? On, yes, it's on okay. a sliding fee scale. Okay. The minimum amount a patient would pay for a visit is $20. And we can work out a time payment for that. Right. Okay. And those that just simply can't do it, we have to write that, write that off. Sure, okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything that I forgot to ask or that you'd like to summarize? Those on your list? Yeah. Is there something I forgot to ask? <clears throat> I, I think that's about it. Of course, right now we're looking at Do Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I spent 15 years working with the YWCA's Domestic Violence Program schlepping food, painting rooms, cleaning toilets, and hiding out victims in my own home when, the, when their perpetrators found out where they were. They found out the location of the shelter, which was supposed to be confidential, but they knew where it was. So they would bring me, the victim, and her kids, and our, all that they had in plastic sacks, and I would keep them in my house until we could do something better than that to, to, to take sure. care of them. Right, okay. But that's... October and breast cancer awareness is October and so all those things come to come to mind because I, I work with those things. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sally, I want to thank you very much You're for welcome. this opportunity. It's My been pleasure. Fun. Thanks. Been okay. Fun. <clears throat>